So hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar, which is substantiating claims for hair care. Uh, so obviously uh, we've got a lot of claims to do of hair care. Um, so we'll be looking at consumer claims mainly today and perception claims. Uh, so just to take you through the agenda, I'll be giving you an overview of the hair care industry, just to kind of think about trends that are happening right now, uh, where might be good to invest or where might be good to product develop. Uh, we'll be looking at global regulations for advertising, just really importantly, before we look at the claims to say how are they regulated globally, what do you need to be mindful of. Um, we'll look at some successful hair care marketing claims, so you can see some examples in the real world of how those uh, claims are used. Basically a summary of consumer research, because that's the kind of claims we'll be looking at mainly, um, because obviously that's what we do. And I'll be looking at the appropriate study design and methodology and showing you some case studies uh, because it's always best to see these things in practice. Um, so just to introduce you to me, I'm the Regulatory Director at Aiton Global Research. I've been here for about eight years now. So I started off as a study manager, basically learning um, clients' needs, objectives for research, and um, concluding things like substantiating claims and understanding how to best design a study and a questionnaire to support that. I really found through this role that the kind of training gap that exists um, sort of throughout the, throughout the whole process is what is uh, the regulatory compliance for advertising. Um, so, you know, where can you say what kind of claims, what kind of evidence do you need to substantiate them? Um, basically what you're allowed to say and where can you use it um, and that's different globally so that's really where my passion is and where my interests are um, and yeah certainly what I try to provide for all my clients uh, things like cosmetic regulation as well was something obviously I'm quite passionate about uh, because anything that can affect our service and what we're providing is basically what I'm focused on uh, so hopefully about to help you with some more information on that today so to kick us off, um, let's talk about the hair care market. So obviously it's huge. Um, as we know, hair care will range from anything to do with treating the hair, looking after it, general maintenance, uh, dyeing the hair. It's a huge range of products. Um, and it's obviously massive. So as we can see, it's in the billions of US dollars globally. Um, it's gonna keep on growing as much of the cosmetics industry is. Uh, it's definitely a growing, growing um, area. Uh, there's sort of trends I've picked out here. So there seems to be a growing demand for organic and natural products. Um, so this is something interesting, um, even if it's not necessarily something that you're looking at the moment, it might be a way to target your advertising, way to target your market. Uh, if you know that's the way that people are going to want their hair care to go. Um, certainly we've seen a lot of things uh, on you know, social media where you get sort of at home treatments. Um, obviously we know in the industry that they're not gonna be as effective necessarily as what we're selling. Uh, but people, you can really use that, I guess, as a kind of stepping stone for your market. So if you know that there are people are saying to put avocado all over their hair um, to kind of at home to help uh, moisturize it, maybe that's the way you go with your products, make an avocado based sort of product. It's all quite obvious, really, but it's just an interesting trend to bring out. Um, we also can see it grow um, in sort of basically other areas. Um, so there's developing economies, um, so any developing countries, people are becoming more conscious now about styling their hair, colouring grey hair. And also another trend I see coming out a lot is about maintaining a healthy scalp. Um, so it's something we see a lot of now as um, kind of uh, basically a hair care sort of necessity is about looking after the actual scalp of the hair so certainly where we are we see a lot of people um, that are developing products that do with trichology you know the health of the hair and the scalp um, and then by feeding that health and feeding the you know feeding the scalp feeding the follicles the impact that has um, and then obviously we're looking at if a consumer can perceive that so it's certainly something interesting to be looking at at the moment uh, I always want to look at the impact of COVID-19 um, because, um, you know, <laughs> obviously it has had an impact on every industry. Um, so it's nothing we can't ignore at the moment. Uh, global pandemic is going on. If you're in the UK as I am, we're going back into a lockdown. Um, so there will keep on being these impacts on the economy and certainly on any FMCG industry. But um, hair care is one of those, basically one of those industries that it seems to be doing really well still. So I wanted to bring this up as almost a positive, um, you know, if we can make positives of it, um, we certainly can with hair care. So mainly, obviously, um, people are not using products at home. 
um then you no, sorry they're not using products in the salon they're using products at home more so again people are going to be spending more on um hair care that they can buy at home um and it also i find that's really interesting from the mckinsey and company reports um they're saying that one of the um kind of categories of products that have really gone up uh, by about 300 percent is hair care as well uh so yeah it's it's certainly going to have an effect on the industry um it's definitely going to be down the e-commerce platform for now um that's well for, for the future i think we're going to see things go more e-commerce um so yeah it's certainly what we're going to see i've seen a question in the question and answers box and i realized i forgot to say at the beginning um i am going to take questions at the end so feel free as we go through to put questions in the q a box and i will answer those towards the end as well so that's our hair care industry. Um, so as I said, these are just my thoughts and the kind of research that I brought up, um, just to kind of get set us the scene for the, for the webinar. Um, but obviously what's really important uh, about when we talk about claims is, you know, about the regulation. How are they regulated? Uh, what is the legislation behind advertising in general? Um, not just about hair care specifically. So ad self advertising self-regulation is basically the way the industry regulates itself uh, quite clearly. Uh, what it means is we're trying to avoid kind of, um, you know, countries trying to avoid government intervention. Uh, and basically make sure that the uh, people that are advertising, so the three parts of the industry, the advertisers who pay for the advertising, the advertising agencies responsible for its form and content, and the media that carry it. Essentially, all those three parts should be aware of the advertising code of conducts that are put out there in the country that they're selling their product, um, and being aware of that code and kind of making sure they're abiding by it in the first place. Um, this is self-regulation. There are obviously authorities or self-regulatory organizations um, that are on top of that. And the reason, the way they're on top of it essentially is a complaint space. Um, so whether it's your consumers or your competitors, you can make a complaint about a product. Um, if you feel like the advert is misleading, um, the claims on there couldn't you know, possibly be made um, or that they, they haven't lived up to your expectations as a consumer. And you can complain to those platforms that is when they'll get involved um so it generally i mean every country is a little bit different but generally they all work in this way um so there isn't people going around picking your products up off the shelf or looking for your website and seeing if what you're saying is lying it's up to you as a competitor or you as a consumer to bring that forward it is consistently going up and up. So every year there's more cases. Um, and there are, you know, self-regulatory organizations that are making a more forward um, kind of step into it. So they're not just relying on complaints. Um, certainly when it comes to things like advertising with children, um, they're actually having a very a proactive role in policing the industry as well. Um, and it's, always, it's also become something um, that consumers are really, really aware of now. There's been a lot revealed about sort of, you know, 60% of cosmetic claims, um, you know, these big tubs, head titles, 60% of cosmetic claims are misleading and things like this. Um, people are becoming really aware of it. So um, even if it is just going to sell on a complaints basis, be very, very wary. Um, We're getting more and more of our clients to be challenged. Um, luckily, they've got the evidence to support the claims, but it's something that you need to be really aware of. And the kind of like buzzwords that they use all the time are legal, decent, honest, and truthful. That's the kind of buzzwords you should have in your mind whenever you're making an advertising claim. Always think about that. They obviously, each um, advertising authority has its own code of conduct. Um, I would recommend, as I said, to read that dependent on where you're advertising your product. If you know you're selling globally, uh, be very wary of what your key markets are and what their code of conduct are. They can be very, very similar. Um, but there are a lot of them are giving out advice as well. So as I said, I'm based in the UK. Obviously, I look at the Advertising Standards Authority here a lot for information and they just they release a lot of advice. If they say a lot of cases come in about certain types of claims, they'll kind of put out an informative uh, web page about it. Um, so that's really good to look at as well. But yeah, generally they're all really similar um, and there's kind of reasons for that. And I'll point your direction at the kind of um, point your attention to the direction of these uh, organizations because it's really helpful if you're not sure of who the advertising standards are in the countries that you're selling. You've got the International Chamber of Commerce, um, who are the, the ICC. They have a framework that countries can adopt um, for their own self-regulatory organizations. So there's about 52 countries worldwide. So when I say they're all quite similar, this is generally because they're all adopting that framework um, and working within there. So 
And like I said, even though there's differences, do you feel quite rest assured that you're not going to have really, um, you know, opposing opinions and opposing codes for, for places you're advertising? Um, there's also the International, Chain, um, International Council of Advertising Self-Regulation, or ICAS, and that has a members list on there, so anyone who is a member of there is going to be listed. It was set up by the European Advertising Standards Alliance, but it is a global um, council, um, and that's really, really helpful again. So because it has the, the right sort of SRO on their global um, database you can just kind of signpost straight away where you want to go they also release really helpful news um, so for example with covid they put out a warning letter from everyone that was a member to say about you know misleading advertising during covid um, and how they would be policing that um, so yeah just really helpful kind of signposts there but generally that is how things are regulated there are federal places um, so federal organizations sorry uh, for example we've got the FTC in the USA um, we've got the N uh, what they call National Media Council <laughs> in um, the UAE um, so yes yeah, so there, there are federal organizations there as well so be really cautious a lot of countries have um, self-regulation but some of them do have federal uh, organizations as well and that's where you see things like lawsuits against misleading ads um, so you really don't want that uh, because generally the self-regulatory organizations will just ask you to remove your advert and not show it again um, whereas yeah it could be a lawsuit if you're looking at something federal so that's a lot of information, very meaty slide, um, but I thought I would summarize it all together um, just to make it, you know, sort of one, one kind of, there's your regulation, there's where you need to go. Um, but yeah, so we've kind of talked about what's regulated and what's the hair care industry is. I want to talk about consumer research. As I said, this is what I conduct um, as part of eight and global research. This is how we substantiate claims. So generally, um, as I said, obviously, the way you kind of stop a claim being misleading is by having evidence behind it. This is one such way you can do that. So basically, consumer research is all based upon a consumer's perception. It's anything that we can send a product um, to a volunteer to test at home and they can self-assess the benefits. So, for example, um, they can say, you know, I noticed less hair on my brush as I was brushing it, um, but they can't say 80% uh, reduced in hair fall or something like that because they can't sort of measure a percentage. Um, so you might find that you kind of use both. That's really common, um, especially with hair care. And I'll kind of show you this a bit later. You can have sort of 10 claims about your product. Most of them are self um, assessed. Most of them can be perceived, but you might choose one really key claim that you say actually you want to get a clinical measurement on that. Um, and so there'll be help with that as well. And we always kind of offer the best advice. Uh, the really good thing about consumer research is it reflects the actual conditions of a product in use. Um, so obviously, if once you've formulated your product and you know what it can do, you'll come up with your usage instructions and that's what we send the participant. It really reflects if a participant was to purchase your, or consumer, sorry, was to purchase your product online or in the shelves um, and, and use it exactly how you wanted them to use it. This is the benefits we expect them to get in a consumer research survey. So sometimes people go down the clinical route and don't get any consumer research, but it really opens you up to kind of criticism from your consumers because there's a very different uh, you know, way of using the product when they're looking at it themselves. You know, a, a, some, it might tell them they have 80% less hair breakage, but if they're not noticing it, um, they won't believe your claims. Uh, so it's really important to look at that as well. Uh, you can also do things like comparison testing. So obviously a consumer can compare products as well um, and sort of judge whether they think that it's, think it's worked or not, essentially. Um, so other reasons, uh, before I go too much into claim substantiation, because I think it's really important to think about consumer research as an overall service as well, which elevates your marketing um, and really you know, helps you make the best out of your marketing um, claims and material. So obviously claims substantiation is at the top for why to conduct it, um, but it should be something you consider to build into your new product development. So think about as you're developing your products, is it going to work? Can we benchmark it against our competitors and see where we sit within there? Can we find out what the product and brand perceptions are at this point? You know, what are people actually thinking about the product before we kind of continue to match? They might like the benefits, but do like, they like the fragrance? Um, would they pay for the product? Do they like the packaging that it's in? 
Uh, you might want to reformulate a product and say there's a new and improved formula. So you have to compare it there. You might want to investigate some new markets. Um, so look at, you know, maybe you're currently selling in the USA, but you want to sell in Europe. So you want to see if people are really rating your product there. You might be launching into China and you need to have evidence to substantiate your claims within China because it's slightly different. Uh, you might want to get other marketing material like testimonials and reviews and some photos and videos to support your advertising. All of these reasons um, is, is something that you can think about and it doesn't have to be thought of separately. You can use one study to get all of these kind of different things out of your consumer research. I've selected a couple of claims there as well, um, which are consumer research claims that we would have substantiated really specifically for hair. Um, so it could be something like 88% of people felt um, said that the hair felt smooth all day. Um, nine out of 10 people would recommend the product. Or it could be 96% of people agreed that it protected their color from fading. So it could be about color vibrancy. Um, so basically anything, as I said, that they can perceive for themselves, that's what we can substantiate. So I've got a really dry throat today. Um, so Basically, I want to break down the six common criteria of cosmetic claims, uh, again, to get our mind in the right headspace when we're thinking about what we can say about our product. Um, this is the EU cosmetics regulation, but I think it's really, really applicable no matter where you are based in the world. This is incredibly helpful. I use these kinds of six common criteria, whether I'm testing a shampoo or a cat food or a, <laughs> you know, anything, a car oil, um, and no matter where I am in the world as well. Um, this is a really, really helpful kind of resource. So to break them down, uh, legal compliance, essentially this means um, obviously your, your product needs to be legally compliant. Um, but for example, you couldn't use uh, a legal compliance claim as a way to market your product because it has to be. Um, so if you say that your product complies with EU cosmetic regulations, it could imply that your competitors' products don't comply, where well, they absolutely have to to be sold. So you can't use it as a claim, um, as sort of a marketing point on your product. You just have to comply. Your claims need to be truthful. That's obviously very obvious, um, but kind of put into context here. It might be that you're using, I don't know, almond oil in your shampoo or conditioner. Um, and you've kind of used that as a claim. Now there has to be enough of that active ingredient present in your um, formulation for you to be able to use that claim as well. So you have to be very truthful about what's in the product um, if you're going to use it as a benefit. You have to have evidential support. Um, so this is a really obvious one. Again, this is what this webinar is all going to be about. How do you get that evidential support? What kind of evidence do you need for certain claims? Um, but every single claim has to be validated. It doesn't matter uh, what it is, you need to have validation behind your claims. You have to be honest. Um, so for example, a good example here that I like to use is if you did a consumer study, um, you said 80% of people's hair felt smooth all day on a consumer study of 100 women. Um, what you wouldn't be able to do is sort of say, um, okay, well, we want to say 200 women are advertising uh, and we think that people uh, would you know, agree with that as well. So we're going to say 200 women. Or if, for example, you said all hair types, you tested on all hair types, um, but say, um, you know, frizzy hair didn't like the product, you could have to, you'd have to remove that from your overall data. So if 20 of those women had frizzy hair, A, you can't say that it's suitable for frizzy hair, and B, you can't count them in your report as well, as long as you're, if you're using the data anyway, if you know what I mean. Um, so yeah, it's, it's an interesting one to think about there. It has to be fair. Um, so a, a good example of this one is an anti-dandruff shampoo. Uh, you wouldn't be able to say that it removes, I don't know, 10 times more flakes than, um, uh, than other shampoos um, if they weren't an anti-dandruff shampoo that you compared it against. It has to be like for like. Um, so you can't sort of, yeah, say it removes more, but find out that actually you, can, you chose a shampoo that has uh, a lot of buildup. <laughs> um, it, wouldn't, it wouldn't be fair to your marketing. And it, all of that really encompasses the last point, which is informed decision making. You need to be able to present all of your information so your consumers uh, can make a really informed decision about your product. So the best thing is if you're going to make claims, be really clear what your evidence is. Um, and, and also, I always think, you know, those really hyper scientific terms um, are quite unhelpful as well for a consumer because they don't know whether it's good or bad. Sometimes it works in your favor because you kind of think, oh, it sounds really scientific. I'm going to buy the product because it sounds really good. Um, but it can be off putting as well because people don't really know what they're getting out of your product.
I've also got this really helpful breakdown from the Cosmetics, Toiletry and Perfumery Association of the CTPA, which breaks down different types of claims. Um, so again, another good thing to have in your head whenever you're looking at developing claims. Um, so to break these down, there's sensory and product aesthetic claims, uh, which are basically to do with the look and feel of the product. Uh, that could be the packaging, uh, the fragrance, those kinds of things, um, anything you know, to do with the product kind of senses. Uh, the performance claims, this is essentially our efficacy claims. Does the product do what it's supposed to do? Uh, we've formulated to make hair smooth. Does it make the hair smooth? If it's a hairspray, does it hold the hair all day? Um, does it perform as you've expected to perform? Ingredient claims, I touched on this a little bit with the almond oil thing. You can absolutely say about your ingredients and as long as you've got evidence behind um, the ingredients, whether it's widely known or if you've done your own tests or your raw ingredient supplier has done their own tests, um, you can say it contains an ingredient which has these benefits. What you can't do with an ingredient claim is say that those, the product has those benefits. Um, so for example, if you're going to say, I don't know, um, let's say almond oil has hydrating benefits to the hair um you can't just say the product has it you have to say that the almond oil is the thing that has it uh you can make combination claims so this is again really common with hair care uh where you'll see you know for best results use it with this shampoo of the same brand of the same product line uh, you do need to have consumer research data or data uh, behind that claim to say that it performs best when used together um, because it's a claim so you can't just sort of make it up it needs to be um, supported um, and comparison claims so this was my example with the anti-dandruff shampoo you're absolutely allowed to make comparison claims um, but make sure obviously you've got the data behind it uh, you can't really target competitors in the eu but you can do that in the us a lot of my us clients again like to sort of pick out uh, specific competitors and, uh, and target them definitely but but really more than ever I always see a comparison claim as a new and improved formula claim um, so we have to compare it against the old formula to do that and say it is improved uh, subjective claims that's what consumer research is it's anything that's based on opinion um, so that's really what we're looking at what is the opinion I would buy this product that's a subjective claim you can't measure that uh, whereas objective claims are you know, absolutely objective, they're facts. So they're generally clinical claims. Um, as I said, 80% less hair breakage or hair fall, that's an objective claim. It has to be measured by an instrument um, and, and we have to make sure we've got that objective evidence. So we've gone through the kind of story of what all the different types of claims are, um, how we're going to substantiate those, but where do we actually see these claims? So uh, another question I always get is, uh, well, if I have consumer research data, where can I use the evidence? Well, it's, it's claim substantiation. You can use those claims anywhere, whether it's on your packaging, if it's on television, or indeed online, social media, wherever. Um, so it always helps to see examples. So I've pulled out a couple of examples here. Uh, we've got Philip Kingsley, who have used the independent consumer trial to back up claims for their flaky, itchy scalp shampoo. Um, so again, these are oral perception um, kind of claims, as mentioned. So you can say people said it soothed their scalp, uh, people's scalp felt more comfortable, the shampoo cleared their flaky scalp, um, it's more effective than other products on the market. Um, so obviously they're using something at the moment and they're, and they're kind of comparing it against that. Um, so a really nice way of those claims and they're, they're really, really high claims there as well. So, you know, over 90% is great, they've got some 100% there. It looks fantastic to your consumers. Um, we've also got our L'Oreal one, which is an anti-dandruff one. So we've got about it being flake free. And you can see they've asterisked, asterisked the claim and said it's on a consumer test of 191 subjects. So they're using, again, making really clear to their consumers where that evidence has come from. We also have Head & Shoulders, which haven't necessarily done it um, that way around, but they have said their claims about it being 100% dandruff free. Um, but they've also said about dermatological testing. So it's another claim that you can use. Um, dermatological testing, you tend to be able to get a safety testing point. Um, you can also get a dermatolo dermatologist to approve your consumer study. And there's lots of ways of getting that claim as well. Uh, but an important one they've put on there as well that I thought would bring up is for all hair types. Obviously, you need to have um, some evidence to say that it's been tested on all hair types to be able to substantiate that claim. Uh, you see advertising can take claims on TV. 
Um, so I've picked out some here. So uh, basically what, it, what they kind of do on TV is you, you pick your claims, you talk about them, but you must quote the um, evidence on the screen as well. Um, certainly in the UK, you have to go through Clearcast, so they will obviously ask for this evidence. I think you have to have 70% agreement to be able to get a claim on TV. Um, but yes, you can see the different types of claims here. Um, and, and I thought what was interesting is a, um, a, 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 the hair, the hair color claim, sorry. Um, so it's up to 100% gray coverage and 85% of people agree that it's up to 100%. <laughs> so it's quite an interesting claim there, but it also says softer, shinier hair. So that must have come from that consumer study as well. Um, so just a nice example here. So shopping channels is another really great way to use consumer research data um, and you must have evidence for shopping channels. I've picked out QVC because as we all know, it's the biggest sort of shopping channel um, globally and certainly in the US, it's very big. Um, but they, they, they have a very clear sort of um, clearing process for any product you'll have on there and it must have claim substantiation and it must be really recent. It has to be within one year. But anyway, what I really want to do here is show you an example um, of some claims on here. And I always really hate this part when I have to change what I'm sharing. So bear with me really quickly. So if I go there. And we should be able to see my screen. Um, hopefully someone will tell me if you can't. <laughs> um, but I'm going to do this. It's a slightly clunky clip, so bear with it because it's going to show um, some clinical evidence and some consumer research evidence. It because you get shine. And as we see in the consumer study that we did, there was 90% of people in the consumer study said that they noticed their hair had more shine more body more bound because it's healthier because it's healthier absolutely and then, oh and then this graphic though is about the hair breakage so 80 percent less breakage that's right so don't forget this is a four piece kit each piece is ten dollars and 75 cents each one of these costs way more than that in fact just the cell therapy is 56 dollars oh here's the graphic we're waiting for <laughs> here's, the, here's the consumer study yeah and like i said you know this i always say i always say hair swag but you know really <laughs> you just notice that your hair feels healthier and we saw 94 percent of the women in the study said that their hair just felt healthier 97 percent, almost everyone said that they knew that the cell therapy benefited them one great so I hope that's all right to share. I'll go back to my screen. Um, so as you can see there, basically, I, like I said, it was a bit of a clunky clip because they showed the wrong graphic, but I thought it was really helpful um, because actually it shows you the clinical one that they had as well as the consumer research evidence. So that was kind of my example I was saying about earlier that you can get lots of different consumer claims and then you might pick up on one um, that, that would be uh, supported by clinical evidence. Um, so yeah, you must have you know, shopping channels anyway, but you can see how effective um, it is when they use it as well. Um, also, just a note to say, be aware that your claims on your labels and packaging are also subject to the code. Um, this was just an interesting news kind of put out there to say that it didn't forget. This was ICAST, so as I mentioned earlier, they're the kind of council for lots of different regulatory organizations. Um, it was something that wasn't ever really seen as a, a kind of claim that they had to um, they had to kind of police before or you know be, be kind of part of their code but it is now um, and the main part of this really is you know if you think about shopping in a shop uh, obviously people might go okay I really want to get an anti-dandruff shampoo and they'll pick up bottles and compare them so it's really important you have your claims on your bottles as well um, on all your labels and packaging um, but of course they still must be substantiated so to kind of I give you the overview, so we've looked at some examples and I've told you how to get them substantiated. But what's really helpful, I think, is always case studies um, of things that we've ran before um, and getting an idea of what the best practice is uh, to be able to get that evidence that I keep talking about. So the first one I want to talk about is a curl shine oil. Um, so basically, you know, the kind of treatment you put on your put on your curls um, to make them look nice and more defined. Um, but also obviously make the hair feel really nice as well. Now, the most important claim about this product is that they wanted it to be suitable for all hair types. Um, so it's something I've been seeing a lot now. It was, it's kind of a big thing that um, you see sort of influencers talk about is curl type. So you've got your 2A, 2B, 2C, and then the same for three, the same for four. That goes all the way from sort of a, a slight wave in your hair, like maybe I've got, all the way to Afro hair. So it's really big claim so that it's suitable for all those different hair types. Obviously, we need to get the evidence um, behind each one and make sure we've got a substantial amount of each hair type on there. 
Um, so kind of bringing into context the legislation, so obviously I talked earlier about self-regulatory organisations. Um, the EASA is one that I brought up, the ones that started ICAS. Um, and it's just to say, when you look at their code, what kind of thing are you looking for? Um, you know, this is the kind of thing that we're looking for when we're looking for the evidence that needs to be provided. Um, essentially, what the EASA warn is that you should always have evidence before you put your product onto market. Um, we've had a few cases in the past where people have got products in the market and realised their claims are not substantiated and had to back that up kind of retrospectively, but you really should have it before you've got the market. The main reason for that being, had we not got the evidence to substantiate those claims, uh, they'd have to take their product off the market with those claims on there because they don't have that substantiation. Um, but also, you know, as it says here, you need to be able to provide that evidence without delay. So, for example, when it says the um, the, the relevant SRO, so for example, if you're sending the UK and they ask for your evidence, you have to have that evidence ready. You shouldn't be retrospectively doing it. I mean, obviously, that, that's the whole point about not being misleading. Um, so it's just kind of bring that up and sort of say what that's about. Um, so the study protocol for this particular study anyway, uh, is based in the UK, because that's the main, main market we were looking at. Single placement product, which means we're investigating one product. There's no comparison here. We just want to know this product's benefits. It's a two-week study, very common for a hair treatment. We're not looking for overall sort of lasting benefits. It's quite an immediate effect. So that's what people are looking for. We wanted female and male participants. Again, that's their key consumer. And the main thing is, is having a breakdown of every single curl type. Uh, it needs to be national if data is to be reliable. Uh, what this means is we wanted the whole of the UK to be invited. We didn't want to just pick out, um, for example, London, because when they're selling this product, everyone across the UK will be able to purchase it. It's really important we had that on there. Um, so what were the results? Uh, what, you know, we kind of sent out that product to those volunteers. We asked them some questions about it and how did they rate it? So to give you a kind of breakdown of what this complicated looking table is, or not so complicated, hopefully, um, at the end of the study, we get a report and it shows the breakdown of every single question. But we also get this really helpful summary table, which is what we tend to use for claims. Two reasons for that. Um, well, if I kind of explain it first, we've got the questions on the left hand side, obviously, we've got the number of people that said they're satisfied or had a neutral answer or not satisfied. And then we've got the percentage of people that were satisfied, neutral or not satisfied. Now, when I was saying this is the reason we use it claims, when you look at the satisfied column, that is what we're using. So A, we have a pass mark on there. So everything is asterisk, which is obviously everything on this case, because they all passed, um, has passed a set internal pass mark. This is usually set about 66% because it's a statistical majority. Um, however, some clients like to set it perhaps at 70 because they want to advertise on TV. So they know that they need to get their 70%. Um, or, you know, maybe they just want a different pass mark internally. Um, so that's what that's kind of for. The other reason it's really helpful for claims is because you can lift it and put it straight into your marketing. So for example, 77% of the people that we asked in the study agreed they loved the hair oil. So it's quite an easy way of using it. So what kind of claims did we get here? Uh, we said that it helped control frizz, it um, made the hair feel smooth, and it gave amazing shine and gloss. So when I was about subjective claims earlier, this really, um, this really embodies those, because it's A, saying things like amazing shine and gloss. That's a subjective thing. You can't really say scientifically, is it amazing shine and gloss? Uh, you can just sort of say about the shine. Um, and do you love this hair oil? These are all really great ones. Uh, we can see there's a big panel there, as I mentioned, we've got our different hair types. So what was important here, our different curl types, sorry, we had to break down um, each single one and say, did they all pass the pass mark, which they did, um, and then they could use that claim as well. So for every single claim, did each curl type suit um, each one? Uh, so that's kind of how that was rounded up. I've got another example here of a different type of hair product because there's so many different hair products and claims, I wanted to give you another example. So this was a hair care regime, and the idea of this one is about neutralizing brassy tones. Um, so if you dyed your hair blonde or highlighted it or bleached it, uh, you need to get some really brassy tones behind it, um, especially as it kind of um, wears off as it kind of gets used to it. So the idea of this hair care regime is to neutralize the, pro the, the hair and clarify it. 
Um, they wanted to get before and after photos for this one as well to use in their marketing, but also to use as further substantiation. Um, so I mentioned this earlier, we can do um, sort of different ways here. We can get professional photos, um, it's something we can do, but very often we get um, photos that people take in home. Uh, so it, obviously it's a very range of, real range of quality. They're not photographers, they're consumers, um, but we do get some really good photos as well to back up the um, and I'll be able to show you those as well. So again, I want to bring up the legislation. Uh, so this is particularly for the ASA because it's in the UK. Um, it's basically saying any sensorial claims which are based on opinion should be substantiated with consumer research, essentially backing up what I've been saying about the kind of subjective claims. Uh, but again, just bringing out what it looks like in the code of conduct for these advertising um, authorities. So what was the study protocol? Uh, it was conducted in the UK. Uh, we're looking at a shampoo and a mask. That is our regime. 28 day study. So it's slightly longer now because we want to make sure that over the duration of the study, the hair is, you know, gradually improving. It's getting rid of more brassiness um, and kind of recording as well when it sort of has the best effects. Uh, we've got a different sort of um, breakdown of the types of um, types of hair here. So we had natural blonde. That was really important. Bleach blonde, dyed blonde. Um, just to make sure that it's working on it every single type. Uh, they have to have some kind of brassiness or discoloration, obviously, because otherwise it would be very hard to rate the improvement there. Uh, they can't have used any, any hair dye or toner recently because obviously, like I said, this tends to be an effect that, um, you know, as it wears off, uh, you see more of. Um, and again, we're looking at national data. So this is the before and after photos to give you an idea of what this looks like at home. Um, so as you can see, it was quite yellowy beforehand. Um, we've got some lovely, really white tones, almost, almost icy, ashy blonde after using it. Um, so some fantastic photos there for them to use in their marketing. Uh, and again, we've got the breakdown of data. Um, so it's exactly the same table as we had before. Um, but this time, obviously, the claims are to do with the brassiness. Uh, so we can see they've got some fantastic results again. 89% uh, about saying uh, yellow tones being removed, the hair looking neutralized, and the hair looking clarified. Um, and 88% saying that the hair color was corrected and that the hair tones were cooled. So lots of really great things they can use in their marketing there um, to say about that brassiness being removed. So that's kind of the best practice, if you will, um, <laughs> obviously having the evidence behind it. I wanted to bring up these examples of what can happen if you don't have the claims um, evidenced in your advertising. Um, more than anything, so as I said earlier, your advertising authorities can uh, obviously ask you to remove your adverts. But the worst thing really is these are all um, headlines. These are all news headlines. So it gives you bad press as well. So examples here, um, Pan 10 were in trouble with the ASA because they had no evidence um, say that hair was 10 times stronger. So there's no scientific evidence. This is what we discussed earlier um, when I was saying that obviously if you use a measurement, a consumer can't say it's 10 times stronger. They can just say the hair is stronger. That needs to be scientific. It needs to be a measurement. Um, L'Oreal were also sued, so I said again, um, that's quite common in the US because uh, it's a federal thing. Um, so this was, uh, the claim was that it could repair up to one year of damage in one use. Um, so obviously they didn't have any um, data behind that claim or not enough data, not enough significant evidence. Um, and a really particular example that I wanted to bring up here as a very particular claim uh, was Hairburst, um, which got in trouble for basically talking about hair growth claims. This is something I want to bring up in particular um, because this is something we get asked about a lot. Uh, so hair growth is obviously taking, um, well, it's kind of put people in hot water a bit recently. Um, so I thought this was really helpful. It's quite a chunk of text, but I'll break it down um, from the ASA or the CAP, which is the copy advice team for the ASA, um, basically talking about hair growth claims. Now, the reason for this being is that because uh, anything that says it can improve hair loss um, is a medical is a medical condition. So if you suffer from hair loss or baldness, it's a medical condition of your hair. Therefore, your product is a medicine if it's um, if it's saying it's going to to help with that. Um, so if your product is a cosmetic, like many hair care products are, you technically can't say anything about um, hair loss essentially. 
Uh, what it does say is that it claims that a product could slow down hair loss uh, or reduce it or promote or strengthen existing hair growth can, um, are unlikely to be considered medicine, medicinal claims. So they can be um, cosmetic. Really importantly, it says irrespective, marketers should hold robust evidence to prove their claims. Um, so generally for hair growth um, kind of products, whether it, you know, like I said, avoid the hair loss, but if you want to say it's promoting natural hair growth, um, you don't sort of just rely on ingredient data, get that consumer research data as well to substantiate it. But it's, yeah, it's just a really interesting topic at the moment. I thought I wanted to bring it up in, in particular. Um, so be very cautious if your product's not a medicine, and that's actually the case of any product in the world. Uh, be really careful that you're basically not saying you're going to cure or prevent a disease um, because that will make your, your product a medicine. Um, you know, we see things like acne claims. If you're saying about acne, that makes it a medicinal product. Um, always make sure that you're just talking about the improvement of something, something, you know, improvement of something cosmetic. Um, so certainly for hair, it should be just an improvement of the hair. So um, just kind of a couple of slides before I go to the Q&A, just to kind of summarise a little bit. Um, so I just want to talk about us a little bit more. So I've talked about consumer research data, um, what we do, but why should you use us as a company? So we're an award-winning research company. We've won family business. We've won international business. Um, we're very, very proud of that. And we, we do always go up for awards. Um, so this is always to do with our service, but also to do with our growth as a company. Uh, we are completely compliant with the GDPR. Of course, we have to be by, uh, by the law. <laughs> um, but we also have our own in-house data protection officer and an ISO 27001 certificate. Uh, we've got an ISO 9001 as well, which is about quality assurance. We have undesirable event reporting built in. I haven't mentioned this today, um, but it's really important to note that we are in alignment with uh, all of the regulations, including the Cosmetic Vigilance Act. We have undesirable event reporting, so any consumer at any time can report an undesirable event. This is really helpful uh, to get actual um, reflect, you know, actual use reflections of undesirable events as well. Um, before you put your product on the market, when you give it to 100 people, are you seeing uh, an unusually high amount of undesirable events, even if they're not serious? Uh, we have full product liability insurance. Not every research provider does, um, but they absolutely should by law. Uh, we are a market research society partner, uh, which means that our, we, you know, we're looking at our uh, research in an ethical manner as well as it being conducted properly and we have full training for things like questionnaire design from them. Uh, you have bespoke regulatory advice from me, that's what I'm here for, and you also get a designated study manager, so you get one person who will know everything about your company and your research objectives and you have one point of contact um, so you sort of passed around the team. Just a couple of FAQs before I go to a QA. and <laughs> a um, So we've got a side panel size, about 100 responses. This is very variable. As mentioned earlier with that case study we looked at, we had all curl types. If we had 12% um, you know, of 100 responses, we wouldn't have very much on each hair type. So we had to do more for that case. Um, so that really depends, but it's just a good starting number when people haven't done consumer research before and they're not sure. I've talked about product li liability insurance, but always let, make sure you let your insurance provider know that you're running consumer studies. Um, you need to make sure that your samples have been safety tested to the point that they can be released to the, um, the consumers on the market. Uh, obviously, we can't sort of risk our, um, our, our panellists having undesirable events that could be avoided. Uh, so sometimes that could be no safety testing and sometimes it could be quite rigorous. It really depends on the product. Uh, your studies should always be conducted blind, um, so we make sure samples that are branded. This avoids any bias in the results. Um, and it's also very important we're doing claim substantiation because sometimes it can be um, sort of put under scrutiny if you haven't got uh, um, you know, unbranded samples there, if they're looking at your evidence. You need to ensure your questionnaire design supports your claims. Obviously, that's something that we can help with. Um, and like it says here, always make sure you seek professional advice uh, because, yeah, that's what we're here for. So I'm going to go to Q&A. I have seen some questions coming in, so I'll start off with those. Um, so answer live, here we go. Uh, so this is from the first, um, the, the first question, uh, the first sort of slide when I was saying about developing countries. Um, I actually really can't help you there. That's going to be really annoying for you. Um, I got it from that news source. Um, I'll skip back at the end and we can see what the news source was to have a look at that. It was an overall kind of, um, Kind of just quote basically to say that developing countries are now putting more attention, I guess, towards hair care. Um, but I don't have the exact countries there, so I'm very, very sorry. 
Um, so again, we've got another question which I think I've answered. So it says, what is the number of participants per claim test? Um, so as I said, this really varies. Uh, to make it kind of boring, um, but this is quite a, a really helpful example. Uh, when we're looking at subgroups, so for a start, you need to make sure that your overall data is enough that would satisfy an advertising standard. There is not exactly a rule on this. There's no written handbook because every claim and product is very different. Um, so generally, like I said, 100 is a really good starting point. When we're then looking at subgroups, we need to be really cautious, and this is the boring bit, about the p-value. So you get a p-value on every statistic. Um, that should be uh, no higher than 0.5. When we um, go, when we get anything lower than about 30 participants, we notice this increase. Um, so basically it means that there's no statistical significance behind your claim, therefore it might not be accepted. Um, so it does really depend, but generally for a subgroup, we're looking at no lower than 30 people, uh, which is where I was saying if we had 100 people and we wanted 12% of each one, uh, that's not going to be enough. We need three times that amount of people to make sure we've got a significant number on each one. So I hope that's helped that one. Um, so here we are, uh, one, uh, would 51% positive answer in consumer research be sufficient to substantiate claims? This is very unlikely. Um, again, it does really depend. Um, like I said, we always go for a statistical majority of about 66% um, because we know that would be enough of it coming to scrutiny. Essentially, if you put a claim out there and an advertising authority was to kind of um, yeah, say like, what's your evidence behind it? Yeah, 51%. The chances are they're going to make you take it down. Uh, what I do see sometimes is people quote it. Uh, it's quite a, an interesting move where people might say, you know, sort of 56% of people agree with this claim. Um, so they're being very, very honest with their consumers. You can absolutely do that. It's just whether you think that's substantial. Um, generally, if you believe in your product, it will do well. It's really unlikely when we're testing a product uh, because obviously it's been formulated to have certain benefits. Um, it's really unlikely that it won't kind of pass those claims, to be honest. Uh, but yeah, I, I would always say go for a statistical majority, be really safe and also don't mislead your consumers. I think if you're going for a 51% claim, you're probably really trying to get away with saying something about your product, which it probably isn't doing. Um, so yeah, but yeah, it's quite an interesting one there. Um, so that's all of the questions I've had in so far. I don't know if anyone else has got any questions burning they want to put in the Q&A box. Um, I will also be sending out this recording as well afterwards um, and you know I'll have my email address and things like that on there so if you have any questions that come up uh, do feel free to email them to me as well but I think that's all the questions for today so I'm going to move along um, just to kind of summarize them um, I will be there if anyone's got any questions I'll, I'll kind of keep it on there for a minute as I kind of finish up uh, but I just want to point your attention to the SES, Society of Cosmetic Scientists. Um, so they've got their distance learning course, which is a recognised course in the essentials of cosmetic science. So if that is something you're looking to develop your skills in, uh, that's something that can be done anywhere in the world, uh, all from home. So do have a look on their website there. Uh, there's also going to be the IFSCC Congress in London in 2022. Um, so if that's something you're interested in attending, you can register your interest there now on their website as well. I've got another question come in. I knew this might happen. Um, so what are what interesting new ways are between uh, advertising hair claims? Maybe something that you've seen. Interesting new ways of advertising hair claims. Um, I don't know. I think it's all kind of the same sort of situation where you're really using things like before and after pics to substantiate those percentage claims. Actually, I'm lying. Something really interesting that we've been doing recently um, is video testimonials. Uh, so we'll get our consumers to do a video alongside um, their consumer research data. As long as that video um, basically goes with the nature of the of the study. So, for example, if someone says, you know, this is the silkiest soft my hair has ever felt, and the rest of the participants did not feel that way, you can't use that video in your advertising. But if they do all agree, um, you can then use that video in your advertising as well. Um, so that's kind of a, an interesting way of doing it. Um, so certainly that's a really good way of using social media. Be careful with influencers. Obviously, they are the kind of new thing for using any advertising. Uh, but do not think that having an influencer means that you don't have to have claim substantiation. What happens is if an influencer goes out there and says stuff about your products and it hasn't been substantiated, um, it will be subject to the code. It counts as an advert to your product. So people can complain about that and you can have your advert removed if you haven't got the evidence to substantiate what they're saying. 
Same as product reviews. If you have product reviews on your websites, but you don't have any claim substantiation, they're becoming your advert, they're becoming your claims. Um, so be really, really cautious. Again, always have substantiation. That's all I can really say. Um, so, but yeah, that's definitely it. I mean, when it comes to new and interesting ways, I think there's just something new and interesting in hair care all the time. Uh, we get to see it. We're at the forefront. I'm really lucky um, that I see, you know, all of our clients testing these really exciting products with new benefits and claims um, all the time. So that's always what keeps it interesting, I think, isn't necessarily, I don't know how you're showing your data, but it's, it's just the claims that people are getting. Um, so I hope that's kind of answered your question there. Right, so I'm going to leave it there for today, guys. But as I mentioned, um, there's my email address there. I'm also going to email out this recording. Uh, so yeah, please feel free to get in touch if you've got any further questions or if you'd like to discuss a project at all. And I'd be very happy to help. Um, thank you all and have a fantastic day.